Welcome back to Robot Cantina. Go grab that bag of Cheetos from behind the couch, brush the crumbs off that sweaty shirt of yours. On second thought, just go change. Hurry, the video is starting in 3, 2, 1. Today we're back to tuning the street legal go-kart and we're going to try to extract every last ounce of power from the 420cc big block. And as a bonus, we'll also do a dedicated fuel economy run. Well, if you recall the last time we fooled around with this car, I invited anyone who was interested over to the Speedduino forum to help tune the car. I have to say there was a lot of great advice, and today we're going to take care of a few issues. I reckon the first issue that was discovered was the map sensor was reading lower than expected. The original data log file shows the sensor was reading 93 kPa at wide open throttle. However, when you factor in the altitude we're testing at, which is about 1,500 feet above sea level, the sensor should read about 96 kPa. So the map sensor seems off a little bit, and this is a pretty important sensor as far as fuel calculations go. So naturally, this is a good starting point as far as the order of operations. Well, there could be several reasons the sensor is reading low. The simplest reason is there is a restriction or obstruction in the intake tube or a clogged air filter. So let's take a look. Of course, we're going to need some tools. You know, this happens almost every day now. Apparently, the garden gnomes come in at night and steal all my tools. The good news is, I found out they bury them out in the yard. So, with a bit of effort and a metal detector, we can find them pretty quick. I think there's something buried here. Yep, sure is. Let's take a look. Okay, now all I need to do is find the rest of the tools. So it's come down to this. I really can't afford to stop video production every time I need tools, so unfortunately we're going to need to send a message to the garden gnomes. Now for bait, we have a choice. Gnomes prefer 10 millimeter sockets, but if you're in a pinch, a 3 8 socket will work. At first glance, they look the same, and in most cases, that should be enough. After all, gnomes ain't that smart. The large victor traps have a notch specifically for baiting with sockets, and I appreciate that. But we're also going to hot glue the tool to the trap because garden gnomes love the smell of hot glue. This makes the trap twice as effective. Trap placement, of course, is critical. At this point, it's fairly obvious the gnomes are attracted to the toolbox, and a well-placed trap in this area would be most effective. Sorry for getting sidetracked. Now let's get back to diagnosing the map sensor. Overall, the intake tube seems fine, the air filter's brand new, and the throttle body seems fine. Well, that didn't take long. Let's see what we got. Ugh. The squeamish folks might want to cover their eyes. Looks like this guy got away. Well, most of them anyway. But I'm going to count that as a success. Off camera, we tested the car with and without the air filter and associated plumbing, and the sensor reads the same either way. Now, normally on a single cylinder engine, the method used for fuel calculations is alpha N. However, we're using speed density. Now, the reason we're using speed density is it seems to work fine on this engine. Ah, uh, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, or in this case, a video. Okay, so we're looking at the dashboard for the EFI computer. And over here is the gauge for the map sensor. And here you can see the tachometer. This little engine idles between 1300 and 1500 RPM. Anyway, the map gauge seems pretty stable. Kind of boring if you ask me. So at idle, the map varies between 1 or 2 kPa, and that's to be expected on a normal engine. But keep in mind, this is a single cylinder engine at idle. The reality is, the manifold pressure is pure chaos, as we can see on this vacuum gauge. So the vacuum gauge and the map sensor are looking at the same manifold pressure, but there's clearly a difference as far as stability. So something's broken, right? Nope. Actually, the Speedwino is using some clever math to average the signal. In other words, the signal, the stable signal, is fabricated. So let's prove that. So here we can select various ways to read the map sensor. So let's select instantaneous and let the EFI computer sort out all the chaos. And the engine stalled. All right, well that was to be expected. This is exactly why single cylinder engines use the alpha N tuning method instead of speed density. So just to be clear, the map signal that we're seeing on the dashboard is not fake, it's the real McCoy. Now the reason it's stable is because some genius managed to write some epic blue ribbon code and we're looking at the cycle average. Unfortunately, this is where my ignorance steps in. 
I personally hate alpha end tuning, and it looks like some clever programmers have made it possible to use speed density on a single cylinder engine, so we're going to move forward using speed density. I guess I got a little off topic. Um, none of this explains why the map sensor is reading a little bit low at wide open throttle. Nope, I think what we have is a minor calibration issue. Let's take a look at the map sensor calibration. The correct reading we should see at our altitude is 96 kPa with the ignition on but the engine not running. Basically at this point we're just reading normal atmospheric pressure at 1500 feet in altitude. So all we need to do is add a few ticks to offset the reading. Now this whole map sensor adventure took a minute or so to explain on video, but in actuality it took days to sort out. Lots of testing, lots of driving, and lots of research. I still may be wrong, but keep in mind, I didn't just breeze through this. So at some point, the alpha end tuners need to chime in and let me know if speed density is the answer, especially since our next step is to add boost. After making major changes to the tune, the car of course has to be driven. Prepping the car for a road test is sort of like launching the space shuttle, except a little bit more complex. We need to add fuel, unplug the external power to the laptop, fire up the global satellite position system, and then and only then can we take the car out to collect data. Well, it looks like we have the map sensor sorted out. So at wide open throttle, we get 95 kPa, um, and it really should be 96, but given the crazy math that the EFI computer is doing, I'm gonna call that close enough. So the other concern the Speedwino forum had was the air-fuel mixture was way too rich. The general consensus is the mixture wants to be at or just below 13 to one when running E10 gasoline. So the thing is, the way I originally arrived at my richer air-fuel mixture was to keep adding to the mixture and checking the performance. So the air-fuel numbers that I was using made the most power according to the testing I was doing. But in the name of science, the air-fuel mixture was adjusted and we did some more tests. Turns out the car lost power and ran like crap. So what gives? The short story is, the calibration for the wideband O2 sensor had drifted a little bit. Now AEM, the makers of the wideband, claim that it doesn't require calibration, but they do have an option for free air calibration. So that's what I did. Free air calibration requires the oxygen sensor be removed from the exhaust and placed in an area with fresh air. The free air calibration is completely automatic, and once it's enabled, it takes about 20 seconds. You know, after all this work, the end result was the performance was more or less the same. So let's call it work in progress for now, but it's highly likely that there's nothing left on the table. The little engine has probably given all it has. Okay, well let's move on to something different and have a look at the fuel economy. So we mapped out a course at the new Hillbilly Proving Grounds, and as you can see, the yellow brick road goes in all four cardinal directions. This will help offset any benefit we may get from a tailwind. The course is approximately 14 miles per loop, and our objective was to do two laps at wide open throttle and one lap at 50 miles per hour. Now this is interesting. On the day we did the test, we had a fairly strong breeze, you know, Kansas. Anyway, with the tailwind pushing us, we got the car up to 70 miles per hour along this stretch. Of course, that's cheating and it doesn't count. So at the end of the test, how much fuel did the car use? The 420cc fuel-injected cement mixer-powered street-legal go-kart burned 3.623 liters of E10 gasoline. That works out to be 5.25 liters per 100 kilometers. 
<laughs> and that absolutely makes no sense to me. This whole metric system will never catch on. Okay, so all that gibberish translates to 45 miles per gallon. Now that may suck for a Honda Insight, but it's damn good for a race car. And that, folks, is what we're trying to build. The stupid way, of course. So the next logical step is to install the stupid charger. Well, that's what we all want to see. Unfortunately, we're still fabricating parts, and of course we're waiting for FedEx to deliver stuff they lost. Not a big fan of FedEx these days. You know, there is something that we can do that I previously said no to, and that is to modify the torque converter. Now for the new folks, this car is equipped with both a 5-speed transmission and a go-kart CVT type torque converter. In simple terms, the torque converter or CVT can automatically change the transmission ratio from a low range of 2.43 to 1, which is effectively first gear, and as the car accelerates, the ratio will automatically change until it reaches 1 to 1. So the range is 2.43 to 1, and it maxes out at 1 to 1. By using the torque converter, we amplify the torque the little engine makes, and this helps accelerate the car. When the torque converter maxes out, we then shift gears on the 5-speed transmission. Now the trick we're going to try is to optimize how fast the torque converter shifts through its range. Perhaps this will help with the 0 to 50 times. Unfortunately, this trick won't help with the top speed. Nope, for that we need more power, and we're counting on a supercharger for that. Anyway, modifying the converter should be simple. All we need to do is open it up and swap in new lighter weight pucks. The modification should slow down how fast the torque converter shifts through its range. Well. Actually, no idea how this is going to work. Last time we tried it with the smaller engine, the results were inconclusive. And that's sort of a scientifically polite way of saying FUBAR should be interesting. So look forward to that in the next video. That's about it for today. See you next time.